Good morning. morning. On this beautiful July Sunday. Uh, The only announcement that I have, Adrian asked me to remind everyone that next week is Soup Kitchen, and I looked at the list this morning, there's still a few openings for servers, and I know she was concerned about that, so I saw a few of you did sign up for that, but if you haven't signed up already, please sign up, and that is next Sunday. Are there any other announcements? I also wanted to welcome Beth DeJulian as our special musician this morning. Um, and the only, well, I do, I guess I should add that um, I know a few of you know already, but Joe is in the hospital. He's supposed to be coming home today, but he has pneumonia, but it's not COVID. So that's good. <laughs> so I am here because it's not COVID. <laughs> so, um, but he's doing much better. He went into the emergency room on Friday and he hasn't been there very long, but I think he's ready to come home. So he's feeling much better. And if there aren't any other announcements this morning, then let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Would you please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 25? To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Please join me in the opening prayer. Faithful and merciful God, we come to this time of worship seeking forgiveness for the ways we have strayed from you and to learn the paths you would have us choose. You make your covenants known to us, and we long to live according to your will. Turn to us and be gracious to us, so that we might walk in paths of steadfast love and faithfulness. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 9 to 14. And the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of the body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soul. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding to you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. The epistle lesson is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of, you, because of the hope laid for you in heaven, we have heard this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Ephesus as our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and he has made known to us you, your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power so that you may have all endurance and patience joyfully, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. 
An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, you, you must, what, excuse me, what, I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus re replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God.
I could just sit and listen to you two all morning. <laughs> so I thought this morning I would take you all back to high school English class. <laughs> wow, that wasn't the reaction I was expecting. <laughs> How many of you had to read The Merchant of Venice? Okay. How many of you had to memorize the scene from, um, what is it, Act 4, Scene 1 on the quality of mercy? Anyone? Well, I won't make you recite it. I, I don't know it by heart either. I have it printed here, but I thought it was a good passage for this morning. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest, it becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Let us pray. God of justice and mercy, Jesus instructed the expert in the law to go and do as the Samaritan. And may we too seek to be merciful. Amen. So a student once asked anthropologist Margaret Mead what she considered to be the earliest sign of civilization in a society. Now, she could have mentioned the first use of tools or the first works of art, but instead she said that in her opinion, the very first sign of civilization was a skeleton that was found with a healed thigh bone. Mead argued that in a competitive, primitive society, uh, culture where people had to hunt and escape predators in order to survive each day, the fact that someone set aside their own work in order to care for another's injury was a sign of civilization. As Mead said, a broken femur that is healed is evidence that someone has taken the time to stay with the one who fell, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. When a lawyer asked Jesus who exactly his neighbor is, the story Jesus told in response points out the difference between our human instincts for safety and survival and God's expectations. A man was attacked and left for dead. A priest and a Levite each passed by the man without stopping, but a third man, a Samaritan no less, took pity on the man and stopped, bound up his wounds, and took him to an inn. Now many of us have learned that the priest and the Levite were bound by Jewish purity laws that prevented them from helping as if their Jewishness forced them to be heartless. But some argue that scenarios like this trigger our evolutionary instincts for self-preservation regardless of our religious beliefs. It was not, as many of us learned in childhood, about religious rules preventing the priest and the Levite from helping. A bleeding, possibly dead man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a clear indication of danger. His attackers might have still been close by, or he could have been part of a trap to lure in unsuspecting travelers. The priest and the Levite were not doing anything shocking in passing by, but the Samaritan was going against powerful instincts to stop and help. We humans have evolved to see the difference between those bound to us by blood or ethnicity, and those not bound to us. And we share our resources accordingly. The pity that the Samaritan felt was adaptive when it was aimed at people like him, but it was dangerously irrational when directed at a stranger. The Samaritan violated the norms of evolutionary selfishness. He reached across ethnic lines that were very real in that day and today. He spent his own money on the care of a complete stranger and entrusted an innkeeper to appropriately use the money that he had left. None of these actions directly benefited him. 
And that is the quality of mercy. So which of these three acted as a neighbor? Jesus left the door open for all sorts of rationalizations that we tend to automatically make. Well, obviously a Samaritan can't be a neighbor. Some stranger lying in a gutter isn't my neighbor. He got himself into that mess. What was he doing on that stretch of road? We all know it's dangerous. Jesus knew all about danger and safety, selfishness and generosity, prejudice and racism. He knew that our compassion tends to be limited to those people who might someday be able to return the favor. He was very attuned to the fact that our nature had evolved to walk quietly by on the other side of the road. But with this story, he invited his hearers to imagine compassion opening their hearts to the humanity of the stranger to consider whether love and accountability might tie us together across family lines, across ethnic lines, even across the lines of personal safety. And as Jesus often did, he left his hearers to answer for themselves, is the reward of living a life of faith worth the risk? Jesus' story led the lawyer to see that his question was really about whether there was a limit to the mercy expected of us. And the priest and the Levite reveal the implications of such a limitation. So who is worthy of mercy and who isn't? Where would we draw that line? Wendell Berry once wrote about the burden of the Gospels, saying, as comforting and clarifying and instructive as the Gospels frequently are, as deeply moving or exhilarating as they frequently are, they are also a burden, sometimes raising the hardest of personal questions, sometimes bewildering, sometimes contradictory, sometimes apparently outrageous in their demands. The Gospels are overwhelmingly concerned with human behavior. Jesus is asking his followers to see that the way to more abundant life is the way of love. We are to love one another with a love that is much more inclusive than just our love for those closest to us. We are supposed to love our neighbors even when they are strangers. We are even supposed to love our enemies. And the love we are called to show one another is practical, not just a feeling, but a willingness to help, to be useful to one another. And that willingness can sometimes put us in harm's way. In 1569 in Holland, there was a Mennonite man named Dirk Willems who had been sentenced to death as a heretic. He escaped prison and was being pursued by a thief catcher. And the two men ended up running across a, a frozen lake and the thief catcher fell through the ice. Without help, he would have drowned. So how do you think Dirk Willems saw his pursuer? as an enemy to be walked by, or as a neighbor to be loved. Well, he actually turned back and helped the man out of the hole in the ice. He saved the man's life. And then the man was forced to arrest him again. <laughs> and he went back to prison and was sentenced and burned to death. So what's the saying? No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> We can't always clearly see the risk of being merciful, and thankfully it's not always a life or death situation. We can't always also see the consequences of choosing not to be merciful. I was talking to Lydia earlier this week, and she shared a story about a road trip that she and a few of her friends took last year after graduation. Now, I know most of you have met Lydia, so imagine four young adults with wild, multicolored hair, gender fluid clothing, driving across the United States. Mostly it was a good trip, but there were parts of the country where they were not very welcome. They were in Louisiana, and they decided to stop at Frog City, a place I had never heard of. I don't know if anyone's been to Frog City, but there is a city outside of um, New Orleans called Frog City. It's not the real name. I can't remember the real name right now, but they're known for selling frog legs to restaurants. So that's their claim to fame. And they have a big metal statue of a frog called Jacques. 
and they wanted to get their picture taken with this frog named Jacques. Now, for most of the trip, the low tire pressure light on their rental car had come on and they'd put air in the tire. Apparently Lydia was the only one of the four that knew how to put air in a tire, so I was <laughs> proud parent. <laughs> At least my kids can put air in a car tire. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it kept coming back on and so they decided to do something more about it. So they stopped at an auto zone and the guy behind the counter was actually very helpful. He gave them directions to the local garage. He said, I'll even call ahead for you. So they drove down the road, got to the garage, the door was locked, and they could hear loud music coming from inside the garage. They knocked on the door and the music stopped, but no one came to the door. They knocked again, still nothing, knocked a third time. Finally, the mechanic came to the door, heard their story and said, we don't do tires and shut the door in their face. They ended up driving over an hour back in the direction that they had come to a firestone where a very kind gentleman fixed the tire and refused to take any money for his efforts. And, you know, thinking about this story, there was very little risk to any of those people in being merciful in that situation. And I hated to think that Lydia and her friends might have ended up along the side of the road in rural Louisiana with a flat tire because no one would help someone that they didn't see as a neighbor. Now that was one of the more, I think, frustrating and annoying, but actually less frightening experiences that they had on the road. I think we all pray that whoever we or our loved ones encounter will be merciful, that others will be called to do like the Good Samaritan did. Fred Craddock tells of meeting Rear Admiral Thornton Miller many years ago when he was the speaker at a college chapel service. After the service, Miller spent some time chatting with the students and an answering questions. And they all wanted to ask him about his experiences serving in World War II, especially D-Day in Normandy. Miller described that day in vivid detail and shared that as a military chaplain, he had gone up and down the beach, dodging bombs and, and gunfire while praying with injured soldiers, doing anything that he could do to help. A student asked him why he had risked his own life on the beach that day, and Miller simply replied, I'm a minister. And so the student tried to reword his question, much like this lawyer in our gospel lesson. He said, but didn't you ask if they were Catholic or Protestant or Jewish? I mean, if you're a minister, and Miller interrupted it and, and said, if you're a minister, the only question you ask is, can I help you? The priest and the Levite and the expert in the law all failed to understand that. Jesus makes it clear that our God is a God of mercy. Jesus doesn't praise anyone for their religious credentials or their knowledge of the law. He commends the one who puts love for stranger into action. He commends the one who risks personal safety on behalf of another. The one who asks simply, can I help? Why did the Samaritan reach out in love to his enemy? And why was this radical and selfless love so important to Jesus? Because all humans, friends and enemies alike, have the same dignity, deserve the same respect, and are worthy of the same compassion. Because all humans are made in God's image, and because that is exactly the kind of love that Jesus showed to each one of us. A person can have all the right answers about God and still not know God. So would you rather have all the answers or would you rather have a relationship with God, even if that relationship calls you to be uncomfortable, to step across lines that divide, to think of others first? The expert in the law set out to test Jesus. And with this story, Jesus tested him and us. What does it look like to love God with all your heart and all your soul and to love your neighbor as yourself? Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The one who showed mercy. Amen.
Are there any joys or concerns to share this morning? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, you call us to be merciful as well. To look at all your children as neighbors and to realize that sometimes we are the ones in need of mercy. We come before you now in a time of prayer, a time to let go of the cares of the world outside these walls and to listen for the guidance of your small, still voice. We ask for your peace in times of uncertainty, your love when we feel alone, your strength when we feel powerless against the evils of the world. We pray for all your children in need as we seek ways to best meet the needs of those around us. We pray for those in positions of power and wealth that they would use the power they have to empower others to care for this world we call home, to seek justice and peace for all. We pray that we might seek and find common ground in a world too often divided. We lift up our prayers for all your children who live in need, who don't have enough food or clean water, who don't have adequate housing, who are facing difficult decisions or circumstances they see as overwhelming who live with illness in body, mind, or spirit. And we pray for all who mourn, that they might know the comfort of your presence. We give you thanks for our many blessings, for this beautiful day, for the gift of music, for worshiping together. And we also share with you our concerns. We continue to lift up prayers for the people of Ukraine in all places of violence and unrest in the world. I pray for Joe as he continues to improve and for all those on the prayer list of this community of faith. In all that we do, guide us in turning toward the path you have set before us, shown to us through the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have been blessed in ways too many to count. Let us give joyfully to the work of God's church in the world.
Let us pray. God of mercy, you call us to be a neighbor to all your children in need. Use the gifts we offer to show your mercy to a world in need. Amen. into the world to be a neighbor to those in need. Go to share God's mercy with others. Go knowing that the love of God surrounds you. The peace of Christ is with you and the power of the Holy Spirit will give you strength to do all that God asks of you. Amen. Amen.